This, first, this next question is Leslie Herod. Leslie, your question is, what more can be done to prevent car thefts, whether it's entire or capital converter, package thefts from porches, or other nonviolent but expensive crimes? Well, this is an issue that is uh, very concerning to me right now. Um, we know that car thefts are up, car jackings are up right now in our city. In fact, I'm very worried that a lot of these young people that we were just talking about um, are the ones who are perpetrating some of these crimes. Um, and they're holding people up, especially down in Cherry Creek and throughout our city. And unfortunately, I'm worried that one day someone's gonna get killed unless we step in. We've gotta break up the organized crime that's happening in Denver. These are rings, people. These are not just individual actors. There are rings here because people are not being, the crimes are not being investigated and people aren't being held accountable. We've gotta have more investigators in the field. Thank you. We've gotta make sure the victims Thank you, get justice. Thank you. Rebuttal? Next candidate taking on this question is Mike Johnson. Mike, what more can be done to prevent car thefts, whether it's entire or catalytic converter, package thefts from porches, or other nonviolent but expensive crimes? Yeah, I think no Denver resident should have to be afraid to walk in their own neighborhood or have to check out their window every night to see if their car is going to be there the next morning. And there are three key things we should do. One is this is the worst city in the country right now for auto theft, and yet we do not have a dedicated auto theft unit in our police department. I would create one. The second thing we need to do is we need to actually put more first responders onto the street. That includes mental health responders to respond to mental health crisis. That means uh, EMTs to respond to physical health crisis. And it means officers to respond to real threats. We don't have any more Denver residents calling 911 and being put on hold. Thank you. It's Mike Johnson, Rabot. Next candidate join us is Aurelio Martinez. Aurelio, what more can be done to prevent nonviolent but expensive crime in Denver? Well, first of all, we have to restructure the Department of Safety. We have to we have to look at our police department. We have to look at our sheriff's department. And I'm saying that we have to adjust that budget so that it can be more effective. My whole plan is to put special patrols, patrols that will that will patrol the uh, central business district, your neighborhoods, and different areas, so that the police can do their job and serve and protect. That's what we need to do. So we don't need to think about defunding any any police department. We think about enhancing it. Thank you. Thank you, it's Aurelio Martinez. Rebuttal. Next candidate join us is Debbie Ortega. Debbie, what more can be done to prevent car thefts and other nonviolent but expensive crimes? First thing I would do is make sure we have a Metro Crime Task Force that is working around our region to address the drugs that are coming into our streets, they're in our schools, they're affecting our neighborhoods and people all across our city. I would also make sure that we're working to fund programs that are boots on the ground people who are working with our young folks and others who need those access to resources and services. We need programs like the Second Wind Fund that has been a program that is preventing kids who are committing suicide in our community. Thank you, Debbie Ortega. Rebuttal. Moving on to our next question within the crime topic. This question is first to Terrence Roberts. Next question. Gun-related deaths in Denver were down last year, but gun-related injuries increased. What more can the city do to reduce violent crime? So being a gunshot victim myself, I just spoke in my past, I was a gunshot victim in 1993 due to some summer of violence. I was a gunshot victim again in 1994. We had 88 homicides last year in Denver. We had 96 the year before that. We had 95 during COVID. We need to make sure that people don't feel like they have to use a gun. Gun violence is an epidemic of poverty and we need to use our public safety budget to address the cycle of poverty. Housing is our main issue in Denver and our violence issue stems from our housing. Thank you. Rebuttal. Moving on, next candidate is Trinidad Rodriguez. Trinidad, same question. What more can the city do to reduce violent crime? I've already talked about the first step in my plan, which is to grow our uh, police force back and restore our ranks. Uh, the next step is to expand and invest in our specialized teams uh, where we will actually achieve greater equity in policing by building trust, which we have to do, restoring trust between our community and our officers, we will start to make, uh, our, our officers will be a trusted partner in fighting crime. That's the kind of city we need. Thank you. Rebuttal. 
Next candidate joining us is Andy Rougeau. Andy, what more can the city do to reduce violent crime? Violent crime is out of control in our city. We've seen almost a tripling of murders in the past 10 years. As mayor, I'll make our city safer so my next door neighbor doesn't have someone try to pry open his door on Christmas Eve and has to huddle with his family on 911, a memory that we seared into their memories. As mayor, I'll add more police officers to our streets to make it safer. As mayor, I'll increase funding for our 911 system so you don't sit in hold. As mayor, I'll give better funding to our police so they can be properly trained. I will fight for our future as mayor by making our streets safer. Thank you. Rebuttal. Next candidate joining us is Kwame Spearman. Kwame, same question, what more can the city do to reduce violent crime? We, we have got to start enforcing our laws. We've stopped. We've had five catalytic converters stolen from our van at Tattered Cover. If we don't enforce our laws, crime continues to escalate, and now we're starting to see that happen with violent crime. You've gotta ask yourself, the people behind me, many of whom have been running this city, either the state legislator or the city council, and they've taken actions that have decriminalized many, many important things, and crime is rising. You're right, I am a CEO, Thank and you. I'm telling you that we need a leader to Thank get you. us back on the right path. Thank you, Kwame Spearman, rebuttal. <clears throat> Moving on to the, time, the, the, the topic of crime, to our last question, our first candidate that will join us is Ian Thomas DeFoya. Ian, the question is this, as shown by the several millions of dollars a year the city pays in settlements, Denver police still have an excessive force problem. What policies would you promote to reduce or ideally eliminate excessive force problems in the police department? Excessive force is a huge issue. When the pandemic began and the civil unrest began, I actually was part of a group of people who immediately wrote the city. And the first thing I said is we need to be logging the non-lethal ammunition and the use of force by these people because that is a red flag for excessive force that costs our government money. It also harms people. This is centered in the impacts to people. There are a lot of suggestions that have been brought forward in the reimagining public safety, over 112 of them. Again, 30 seconds isn't enough for us to get into all of them, but I support many. Thank you, Zia Thomas DeFoya. Rebuttal. Next candidate is Robert Trenta. Robert, what policies would you promote to reduce or ideally eliminate excessive force problems in the police department? We need to step up internal affairs. I don't know if anybody's been tracking the Memphis what's going on down there. These police officers were recorded, you know, long before the incident happened. And if, if we had a real internal affairs department that listened to phone calls when you called them and said they're gonna go talk to those officers, that will solve all of our problems. Most of them. <laughs> Thank you. Rebuttal. Next candidate is Jim Walsh. Jim, what policies would you promote to reduce or ideally eliminate excessive force, pro excessive force problems in the police department? I would expand the, definitely expand the STAR program. I'm not sure who started that, but um, <laughs> I, I, I heard several people take credit for that, but I would expand that. Um, police uh, training, de-escalation. De-escalation first and foremost. Mental health care, we talked about mental health care for unhoused people, what about mental health care for police as well? and very traumatic work. I, I'm uncomfortable also with the emphasis on heavy crime. I think historically that's been used to justify the remilitarization re of police forces. So we have to be careful with that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Walsh. Rebuttal. Last candidate joining us is Thomas Wolf. Thomas, same question. What policies would you promote to reduce or ideally eliminate excessive force problems in the police department? So um, police are huge portion of our budget for safety, so we should know what we're getting. Um, in, in the business world, you manage that employee. If they're creating that liability, that would come out of their budget, out of their department's budget. Currently, it comes out of the general fund. That's, uh, there's no connection there. I, on, this, uh, on this campaign, I met with the new chief a number of times, and I haven't once heard him talk about how he's managed by our mayor. Our ma he works for us. We have to explain to him how we want to be policed and how he carry, conducts safety for us. There's Thomas Wolf for Bubble. Okay, that concludes our topic of crime. Before we get to our next topic, we're gonna do a couple of things. First, I wanna provide an update 
Earlier in the debate, I mentioned that Al Gardner, a candidate on the ballot, was invited, was able to participate. We were able to receive a note from him, and he has a positive one that I wanted to send, share with our audience. Uh, this is directly from Al. My daughter gave birth to my granddaughter this evening after a difficult delivery. <laughs> I so needed to miss, but needed to be there for them. Thank you so much for inviting me. So we certainly need to speak, speak for our audience saying that we wish him and his new granddaughter the best. Also, this is a break in our debate, we're going to be doing some yes-no questions. What I'm going to ask the candidates to do is to stand so that everybody in our audience can see them. They can be clearly seen on the line, standing for yes, and then when they sit down, standing for no. We'll do eight yes or no questions. So, it is stretch a little bit, and we're getting some stretching in the live audience, so let's face the first yes no question Do you support lifting the current easement on the Park Hill golf course? Please stand if yes. Thank you. Please stand if no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I will ask for candidates, even though yes no questions are hard, because usually in politics the answer is it depends. If it's 51 49, please go one way or the other. Next yes, no question. Do you support the current urban camping ban? Please stand if yes. Thank you. Please stand if no. Thank you, everybody. Keep it rolling. Thank you. Next yes, no question. Have you ever held elected political office? Please stand if yes. Thank you. Please stand if no. Thank you. Snaps from noise to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going with our yes or no questions. Does Denver have enough public green spaces? Please stand if yes. Please stand if no. Thank you. Next question, should police department funding be increased? Please stand if yes. Thank you, please stand if no. Thank you. Going to our next yes no question. If state law allows, would you support any form of rent control measures? Please stand up yes. Thank you. Please stand up no. Thank you. Next yes no question. Do you feel Denver has built and managed bike lanes correctly? Please stand up yes. Please stand up yes. Please stand up no. Thank you. Last yes or no question for this round. Should it be harder to drive in downtown Denver? Please stand if yes. Please stand if no. Should it be harder to drive in downtown Denver? Let's go. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I hope that the kids enjoy stretching the legs a little bit. Let's keep going. I appreciate everyone's attention on this. This is very important, and I appreciate everything the candidates are providing for us. We're going to keep on, on target and on time. Our next topic is growth. The first candidate who will join us for the topic of growth is Thomas Wolf. The first question is this, and this, like most of our questions tonight, were offered by our community. I want to give our community a quick shout out for offering these questions and thank them for the participation. We were overwhelmed with those. Yes, we can, we can acknowledge the community. Thank you for And again, this is going to be going to Thomas Wolf first. This is a, uh, I live in Denver with my 12 year old and I'm an advocate for safe, dignified streets. I feel hopeless about Denver ever meeting its vision zero goals and living up to its state of transportation. What would you do as soon as you took office to get us closer to our vision zero goals and truly prioritize pedestrians? I think the first thing uh, I've seen in studies is to electrify our fleet. Uh, that's the biggest pickup uh, towards this goal. Uh, safety on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the issue we just went through with the, with the sidewalks, that that, that, is, that isn't provided by your city and it had to go to a... a um, a, a ballot where an outside agency is going to now look at the provision of, of sidewalks as an absolute failure. Thank you. Thomas Wolf, rebuttal. Next candidate to join us is Kwame Spearman. Kwame, the question again 
What would you do as soon as you took office to get us closer to our Vision Zero goals and prioritize pedestrians? I am so excited to be your neighborhood mayor. And this is the perfect question for our neighborhoods. We've got to go into each and every one of our neighborhoods and ask what they want for transportation. Some neighborhoods, quite frankly, like the ones that I grew up in, there aren't that many pedestrians walking around. But neighborhoods like the one I live in in Whittier, we've got to have more sidewalks, we've got to have more micro mobility. Downtown, I didn't quite understand the driving question, but we got to focus on bikes, we've got to focus on people walking, and we've got to focus on eliminating the brown cloud. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal. Next question goes to Renata Behrens. Renata, the question again, what would you do to get us closer to our Vision Zero goals and truly prioritize pedestrians? Uh, I, would, uh, buy, uh, I would build the sidewalks, of course, but there is a problem. If the sidewalks are owned by the, uh, by the city, they have to be maintained by the city. And who can do that? Community work. Let's do it by the prisoners. We have lots of them, and they owe us something. And in winter time, it's even worse because you cannot step in onto a bus because the ice and the snow is not being removed, and you can break all your all your bones before you are. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. Rebuttal. Moving forward. Next candidate to join us is Terrence Roberts. Terrence, again, the question, what would you do, what would you do as soon as you took office to get us closer to Vision Zero goals and prioritize pedestrians? I think the city of Denver needs to, of course, like Ken said, make sure we have great walkable sidewalks. It should not be a valid measure for us to fix our sidewalks, especially around places like Windsor Gardens. Um, I, I am for bike lanes, so we just make sure we need to make sure they're in the proper place and that they're helping to get people on bikes <laughs> safely through our city streets. Some of them are placed in property. That's why I didn't answer that question. Um, we also need to work with RTD to have more energy efficient buses, clean energy buses, buses with great schedules and more um, train systems to get more cars off of our <laughs> streets. Thank you. Rebuttal, Chris? Chris Hansen with Verbo. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, those are all great answers, but Vision Zero is about reducing deaths of bikers and pedestrians. And no one has mentioned the epidemic of distracted driving we have on our streets. Next time you stop at a stoplight, look left, look right. How many people are on their phones texting or doing something that takes their attention away from the street? Hundreds of people every year are dying in the state. I brought the bill last year to try to end that practice. My colleague up here on the stage wouldn't even bring it to a vote in the House of Representatives. We passed it out of the House in bipartisan support. We are missing the biggest problem on our streets right now, distracted driving. Thank you, Chris Hansen, for rebuttal. Renata? <coughs> we'll get to all the rebuttals. Renata Barons, this is your third rebuttal. I think the problem is we need public transportation, free, right now, for everybody. Then every commuter can leave their car at home and they have a stress-free ride uh, to the to the job and can work more efficiently, and this is a, a solution for the brown cloud in Denver. The emission will be the air pollution will be decreased, and someday we can um, breathe freely and don't have asthma anymore. Thank you, Renato Veres. Rebuttal. Further rebuttal. This is your turn. Yeah, this is my last one. But an issue that I've been working on for more than a decade. I'm actually a survivor of being hit by a car when I was seven years old. I sat on the Mayor's Bicycle Advisory Committee and worked to build the very first bike lane in Denver. Vision Zero isn't about people's behavior, it's because our infrastructure is dangerous by design. That is a basic principle of Vision Zero, and so for my bike advocates watching, believe me, I want to take on our high injury network. This is a term about where the most accidents are happening. It's on a very few amount of roads. We have to take action and use our resources there instead of waiting. Our plans need to be put in action. Thank you. Ian Thomas to point the rebuttal. Next, uh, any rebuttals? Moving forward to the next question under the growth topic, Andy Rougeau will be our first candidate. Parts of the city, including neighborhoods here in North Denver, have seen growth executed poorly with new builds that do not fit a neighborhood, among other problems. What is the most important problem around new construction 
that needs to be addressed by the city. The most important problem facing new construction is we're not doing enough. We don't have enough homes for young families, for blue collar workers, for first time home buyers. It's not reasonable for people to commute in from 45 minutes to an hour away to not drop their kids off at school. That is a failure of the people on this stage to not build enough housing. As mayor, I'll fix our broken permitting department to make sure that we can build enough housing. I will get rid of regulations that are increasing the cost of housing and making our housing, housing ugly. I'll get money out of the process and fight for our future. Thank you. Rebuttal. Next candidate will be Mike Johnston. Mike, the question again, what is the most important problem around new construction that needs to be addressed by the city? I think this is one of the places where we realize how interconnected these challenges are, which is when you have a city where teachers or nurses or firefighters can't afford to live, what do they do? They live 10 or 20 or 30 miles outside of town and they have to commute into the city every single day, which means you have more congestion, you have more traffic, you have more challenges and impact on climate. This is why we have to take a stand and actually be able to build affordable units in the city where all the people who serve the city can afford to live. And that's what I would do and put those next to transit oriented development sites so people can be able to both take light rail, take the bus, and then walk and use bikes if they're downtown. Thank you, that was Mike Johnson. Rebuttal. Next candidate on this question is Leslie Garrett. Leslie, the question, what is the most important problem around new construction that needs to be addressed by the city? Well, you first mentioned uh, the residents in uh, North Denver uh, and the construction that's happening, the bills that are happening around here. I think the number one thing that's the problem right now is that the community is not uh, as engaged um, and at the table as they should be when these discussions and decisions are being made. So growth is happening without the people that actually live here. Uh, I think that's important. We also have to make sure, and in my administration, what we'll do in the first term is create a plan that brings people back to the neighborhoods they grew up in. So they can afford to live in these new builds, if they, if you will, so that they actually reflect the community and bring the community back. That's a priority. Thank you. Leslie Heron, rebuttal. Aurelia Martinez. That is your third. I say the last but the best, okay? <laughs> Listen, this is the reason I'm running for mayor. This is the one reason I'm running for mayor is to bring control back to the neighborhoods to the neighborhood organizations, the people that live in this city, the people that work in this city, and the small businesses that are suffering in this city. We have to have them stop being ignored. This city administration ignores you, and we have to stop that. You have to have control as to what happens in your neighborhood and what affects your neighborhood, and that's my priority. Thank you, Brother Martinez, thank you. Any further rebuttal? Next candidate of this question is Trinidad Rodriguez. Trinidad, the question, what is the most important problem around new construction that needs to be addressed by the city? The biggest problem is permitting delays. Um, we've got to cut the red tape. We've got to make this uh, process to get permits way more efficient. Costs are being driven up on projects and they are taking longer, way longer to complete. Uh, we actually have um, a, a, a homeless population who are just waiting for their homes to be completed. The way we do this is by uh, using experts in logistics and bringing those experts in by either... Um... Thank you very much. Uh, for the rebuttal? Okay, moving on with the growth topic to our next question, the first candidate for our next question in growth will be Kelly Brock. With the pandemic changing the way everyone works, such as increasing remote and hybrid work situations, nearly all cities are needing to rethink how to manage its downtown core. What are the most important considerations in managing the next 10 years of Denver's downtown core? Today we're probably at 50% of our workforce being downtown, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, and we have retail and restaurants who have grown to be able to support services for 100%. We have to transition our office buildings as quickly as possible to residential. So we reactivate downtown. We also have to make sure that we house and shelter people so they're not living on our streets because I think it makes our downtown more welcoming. And the combination of people living there, visitors coming back, um, and not limiting traffic going downtown yet would be very important on the yes, no question. Thank you, it's Kelly Brock, rebuttal. Next candidate joins this question is Chris Hansen. 
Chris, what are the most important considerations in managing the next 10 years in, the down, in Denver's downtown core? Yeah, this is a moment for reinvention. We are coming out of the pandemic. We are at very low levels of occupancy downtown. The, the biggest buildings in you know, the upper downtown are now being vacated by their owners. We have to reimagine. It does include more residences. It includes the redevelopment. It's going to add lots of new housing opportunities in and near downtown. That's how we reactivate. That's how we remake the great Denver that we all want and, and love. And I think that's our path to, to reinventing ourselves. The new normal's gone. We've got to recreate with more residences and more activity, and I can't wait to do that as your mayor. Thank you, Chris Hansen. Next candidate, uh, Rubo. Andy Rougeau, this is your last one. The issue facing downtown is not what we just heard. It is not, not enough tax breaks. It's not how we're converting commercial office space. It's a lack of safety. Right now, if you go to downtown, you do not need to feel safe. That is why, as mayor, I will enforce our camping ban now, add corner police officers, make it safe downtown again. So businesses aren't leaving Union Station and moving to Cherry Creek. So people don't say they don't feel safe getting out of their car and walking to the restaurant on a Saturday evening. Thank you for supporting this wild fight for Denver's future. Thank you for the rebuttal. Next candidate for this question is Aurelio Martinez. Aurelio again. What are the most important considerations in managing the next 10 years of Denver's downtown core? Boy, I wanted this question. Thank you. <laughs> Everything that's going on downtown has to be scrapped. Okay? <laughs> you can't just say we're going to give free rent, less rent to, to bring businesses back downtown because it doesn't work. If they don't have a clientele, if they don't have a customer base downtown, it doesn't work. It's not going to work. We have to redo 16th Street Mall so it, it becomes attractive and we have to put attractions downtown, something like the sky drops, something like the zip line you see up there. We have to make it. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to our next candidate. Thank you. Our next candidate is Ian Thomas Tafoya. And the question again, what are the most important considerations in managing the next 10 years of Denver's downtown core? Well, growing up here in Denver, I rode the bus to my job at the Museum of Nutrient Science and I transferred the bus and you see we use the pay phones. We've come a long way since then. I do think we need to support the small businesses as we add housing. I agree with that. But there is also a lot of housing taking place outside of what we consider the commercial district. Look at what's happening at the uh, Pepsi Center. We have a huge responsibility to ensure that there's more connectivity across the river so that people can come into the downtown area who don't have the access now in a safe way and it's not in a car. Thank you, Ian, Ian Thomas Tafoya. Any rebuttal? Moving forward to our next question, the first candidate for our final question in growth will be Jim Walsh. Jim, last question is, many neighborhoods in Denver have had ethnic and cultural traditions disappear due to gentrification. Do you feel any steps need to be taken by the city to protect cultural heritage within Denver's neighborhoods? Absolutely, uh, 100%. I think whoever the next mayor is needs to pour resources into this. Um, you know, there's many neighborhoods in the community. I've been a North Sider for 26 years, and when I moved here, um, everyone on my block, um, there was great economic diversity. Um, that's all gone. Uh, the, pe the people that used, used to be my neighbors have moved out and they've been replaced by very young, very well-to-do um, couples. So I think we need to restore that. Thank you, it's Jim Walsh for both. Next candidate joining us is Debbie Ortega. Debbie, the question, do you feel any steps need to be taken by the city to protect cultural heritage within Denver's neighborhoods? Absolutely. I live in one of the neighborhoods that has changed drastically. My neighborhood doesn't look anything like what it used to. I think we need to continue to find ways to preserve our historic properties, and we now include um, cultural contributions as part of that, so that we are working very hard so that people who have lived in these neighborhoods that, or, or maybe have left, come back, don't even recognize their neighborhoods. So I think preserving our properties through historic designation is a big part of how we do that. Thank you. Stevie Ortega for both. Next candidate to join us is Robert Trepa. Robert, question, what, do you feel any steps need to be taken by the city to protect cultural heritage within Denver's neighborhoods? Uh, sure. 
Yeah, <laughs> things need to be, steps need to be taken. However, the reality of it is, I know many people that have sold out of the neighborhood of the Highlands for $500,000 for the house to be knocked down. These people um, leave the community with a chunk of money. Um, and then a developer comes in or a builder, I'm not a developer, and uh, we'll build a brand new house on that property. We have to figure out what, what we can do to make those people, to keep those people to stay. Thank you. Uh, Rebo, Philly, what's your last one? It strikes me this is an incredible opportunity to think about our park space and our open spaces and for our community to begin to shape those spaces so they're culturally relevant and spaces that people want to visit from across the city. I would focus on doing just that throughout Denver. Thank you. Further rebuttal? Last again to join us on this question is Lisa Calderon. Lisa, the question, do you feel any steps need to be taken by the city to protect the cultural heritage within Denver's neighborhoods? Absolutely, and that's why I ran for the first time in 2019 and came in third. Our Black and Latino communities are at the highest rate of displacement. Uh, our cultural communities are disappearing. We couldn't get this administration to listen to the urgency of what we were feeling. Uh, we also know that our creative class is being pushed out. Uh, if they are not able to um, afford a place to live here, much less a space to rent, uh, they are going to other places. <laughs> Santa Fe Drive is our first cultural place, and we need to recognize and to Thank keep you. people here. Thank you. Lisa Colderon. Rebuttal? Mike Johnson, this is your last report. <coughs> One of the things we have to do to protect these communities is to make sure that the families that have lived there historically are able to stay there. Uh, and that means being able to purchase a home. One of the reasons why we know we have such dramatic wealth gaps in this city is because for 400 years we've denied particularly black and African American families the chance to own homes. And the biggest gap to doing that was the inability to get a down payment. Uh, that's why I helped launch a fund called the Deerfield Fund, which is designed to help families get access to down payments so they can get into homes and stay in neighborhoods where they were raised. What I would do as mayor is expand that program citywide so we can make sure all of those folks who want to stay in neighborhoods they grew up have the chance to own a home where they grew up. Thank you. Further rebuttal? Okay, let's get to our last uh, general topic of the uh, debate. This is going to be a topic of the environment. Our first candidate to join us in this uh, round is going to be Thomas Wolf. Thomas, your first this question in environment. How can we make both single family homes and multi family housing more energy efficient in order to reduce the emissions? Do you use the fleet answer again? I guess that was the wrong answer to the other question. Um, so if you're keeping score at home. Um, I was actually on the uh, board where we built the uh, MCA, the Contemporary Art Museum, and we followed some of the LEED protocols, and we're, we were the first museum that got uh, LEED certification, which was really interesting. I think a lot of those um, processes and, and uh, material choices are, are a, a good guide, uh, good guidelines for that. Um, the trick is to get it that they're economic at, at, at scale. Um, I think in, in some of the city projects, they could do that to be kind of the leader, leader in that. Thank you, that's Thomas Wolf. Next candidate to join us is Jim Walsh. Jim, the question, how can we make both single family homes and multi-family housing more energy efficient in order to reduce the emissions? I think a lot of this comes down to education. I've been an educator for 27 years and much of this is just knowledge of what practices and, and processes to use to make your home more, more energy efficient. That comes down to everything from um, when, to have, when to turn the heat up, when to turn it down, what, what to use for insulation, windows, all of that. So just education would be my focus. Thank you, this is Jim Walsh for Buttle. Next candidate will join us is Robert Trekka. Robert, same question. How can we make both single family homes and multifamily housing more energy efficient? Okay guys, I'm the only builder here. 27 years I started my own business. Um, I've built the most energy efficient house in the city of Denver. The address is 4531 Beach Court. Google it, Google Earth it. You will see 28 solar panels on that house. I drive 63,000 miles with my Tesla on those solar panels, only with the solar. Um, 
it's, it's crazy that we're talking about building energy efficient homes. I know how to do it, guys. Okay, I just let me let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're both. Next candidate join us, Ian Thomas DeFoya. Ian, a question. How can we make both single family homes and multifamily housing more energy efficient? Well, this again is one of those questions where there's a lot of components to it. I would like to say that I've been named by 303 Magazine the candidate with the most environmental experience of everyone on this stage. I actually passed a law in 2017 called the Denver Green Roof Initiative, which required solar panels and green roofs to lower energy and produce energy on the largest multifamilies. The other components are about financial literacy. It does come back to education. We have to show you all of the resources that are available now from the federal and state level that you can lower your energy bills, which is also a part of how you stay in your home. Thank you. Rebuttal? Chris, yeah. this is your third. <coughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I think my record in the state legislature speaks for itself. I have led the effort to decarbonize and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in this state. I continue to do that work in the state Senate. And we are a national leader because of the great teamwork we've had at the state capitol over the last three years. That has resulted in huge environmental gains for the state. And I want to continue that work as your mayor. I've got a plan to do that. I can't wait to share more about that as we continue this line of questioning. Environment is a huge priority for this city. Thank you, this is Chris Hansen for the rebuttal. Moving forward, this is a fresh question and our candidate to join us for this question is Kwame Spearman. Kwame, as RTD continues to cut services and struggle, more residents have called for individual cities to step up mass transit efforts. How would your administration tackle mass transit issues? So I have a transit bill of rights on my website, kwameforDenver.com. Please check it out. Uh, I don't think our RTD is serving Denver well right now. And one of the first things as mayor is having an honest conversation with our city about how we can influence RTD to actually represent Denver. We need more micro routes, we need different types of transportation, and we need better security on the RTD options that we have in place right now. We also need to do our own thing on micro mobility. The e-bike rebate is fantastic. We've got to do it. And Robert said he's going to let him borrow his Tesla. So, <laughs> Next, uh, everybody. Next candidate to join us is Andy Rougeau. Andy, same question. When you, uh, how would your administration tackle mass transit issues? So, Kwame's right, RTD is struggling right now. I talked to an RTD driver who'd been mugged three times in the past year driving the bus. We had a story in the Washington Post running nationally about how unsafe our RTD is. We can't meet our climate goals unless it's safe to use mass transit in our city. That's why as mayor, I would fight for our future by ensuring that we have enough police officers to keep our, our RTD safe, by making sure we have enough drivers by making sure they're safe on our buses. Thank you. Thank you, Zandy Rougeau, Bravo. Next candidate is Trinidad Rodriguez. Trinidad, how would your administration tackle mass transit issues? This is a hugely exciting opportunity for my administration. We will start by actually for the first time building our city around the transit infrastructure that we uh, can leverage to much greater effect, much more efficiency, and much higher quality of lives. Secondly, using technology, promising technologies like self-driving, but don't let it happen for single occupancy vehicles like this one over here. Let's use it for people movers. Um, let's restrict the use of that technology to people movers so that we're moving people uh, much more frequently and safely. Thank you, Trinidad Rodriguez. Uh, rebuttal. Moving forward, Terrence Roberts. Terrence, how would you and your administration tackle mass transit issues? As you spoke on this earlier, one of my answers about bike lanes. Um, so just for clarity, the city of Denver does not govern RTD. They have their own governance and their own elected board members. It's like we do not govern DPS. But we do need to make sure that they have efficient buses. Um, we need to make sure that they have uh, better bus routes. We need a better train system. We need a train system from Denver um, to Central City and beyond. We need a train system going north, south, east, and west out of our metro area to make sure that we get cars off of the streets and it's safe for walkers, rollers, and bikers. Thank you. Terrence Roberts, rebuttal. Debbie Ortega is our next candidate to join us. Debbie, 
How would your administration tackle mass transit issues? So the city of Denver is already moving to do the most rapid transit along the Colfax corridor. As the mayor, I would be working with Aurora and with Jefferson County so that we have that line that goes from one end of the metro area to the other. That then changes how our bus system works and our routes don't all have to come downtown. And then we close the gap for first mile, last mile by making sure that we have the connectivity using some of the modes of transportation that were mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal? Moving forward to our next question, Aurelia Martinez will be our first candidate on this next question. Despite Denver's aggressive environmental efforts, Denver continues to have poor air quality. How would you prioritize environmental efforts in your administration? What solutions would you champion? First of all, Denver has to stop promoting highway traffic coming through our city. We have to, we have to have them use the C470 system so they can go around, that's what they were built for. As far as, as far as the RTD issue, we have to put more park and rides around that C470 system so that they are forced to come in, park and ride, and come in and stop, and stop the high traffic in Denver. It has to happen. Thank you. It's really Martinez. Rebecca. Next guest join us, Mike Johnston. How would you prioritize environmental efforts in your administration? What solutions would you champion about poor air quality? Yeah, this is where our failure to take more courageous action on climate is actually now a public health issue. When you think about the fact that people who came to the state or stayed in the state because they love to be outdoors now have to worry if you can go for a hike in the summertime with your grandmother or your child because they may have exposure uh, to contaminants, that's not to say that one. We have to take more aggressive action. That means doing common sense things like incentivizing ways to get fossil fuels out of our economy, electrifying buildings, electrifying vehicles, providing incentives for things like e-bikes and electric vehicles, but also making sure that they're equitable. So we have things like community solar Thank gardens. You. We really can't afford to put all those panels Thank on the you. roof. Thank you, that's Mike Johnson, rebuttal. Leslie Garrett is our next camp to join us. Leslie, how would you prioritize environmental efforts in your administration? What solutions would you champion specifically about poor air quality? Well, as someone uh, with asthma, um, I will say that when we have poor air quality days, it affects me directly and so many others. As was mentioned, we need to do more to make sure that more folks like me and you and so many others don't have asthma. Um, one thing I will say is that when we have our bad ozone days, it means I can't even go outside to walk my dog. That's real for Denver. We think we're the greenest city in this nation, we are not. And I actually give, I have to give a, 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 my hat off to uh, my colleague up here, Ian, who has been working at the state level to hold big polluters accountable. That's where we're gonna find a reduction in uh, bad ozone days in our city is by holding those big polluters accountable. Thank you, Thank Ian, you. for your work on that. Thank you, Ms. Leslie Gary. Rebuttal. Next hand on this question is Chris Hansen. Chris, how would you prioritize environmental efforts in your administration? What solutions would you champion? Thank you. I was so hoping to get this question. Uh, done a lot of work on this at the state. Many of the things already mentioned tonight are things that I've helped legislate on. But specifically for Denver, we have a massive opportunity in front of us. Electrify our buildings using heat pumps and hot water heat pumps. This is a billion dollar opportunity, multi-billion dollar opportunity, tens of thousands of new jobs. And here's the great news. It's going to drastically reduce pollution, reduce the brown cloud, and we're gonna pay ourselves to do it because it pays off when we've all just had to pay big natural gas prices. Wouldn't you like to have to stop doing that? <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, that's Chris Hansen, any rebuttal? I'm sorry, Renata, Renata, you don't have it enough. <laughs> okay, uh, up here, Thomas, you do have one? Right there. Sorry. Um, I'm always baffled on this one because these are for air and water uh, quality standards. Those, those are federal rules. Um, we have, I think, the largest EPA office outside of DC, about two blocks from my office in Lodo. Why are our elected officials not pressing the federal agencies against our biggest polluter, which is Suncor, to the north of town, and confronting them on this? That is, that, I mean, talk is cheap, but let's make let's see some action. Thank you for the rebuttal. Okay, let's move on to our last question within the environment topic. Our first candidate will have uh, be answering this is Lisa Calderon. 
Sloan's Lake, a major attraction economic generator for Denver's west side metro area, is routinely unsafe for public use and has endured years of neglect. How would you ensure that your parks department allocates the resources needed for Sloan's and other parks facing similar challenges? Well, as a fourth generation Denverite who grew up riding my bike around Sloan's Lake and also serving on the Parks and Rec board, um, it really is around having a Parks and Rec board that has teeth. Right now, it really has no power or authority. And we, what we have is an appointee who then makes decisions for parks. We need to listen to the folks uh, who use parks and really think about our park system as citywide rather than just the people who are around it. Um, and so we need to have more input in uh, how our parks policy is being developed. Thank you. Well, Lisa Calderon, rebuttal. Moving forward, next candidate, Kelly Brough. How would you ensure that our park, your parks department allocates the resources needed for Sloan's and other parks facing similar challenges? As voters, we approved a dedicated tax uh, for our parks that would prioritize work like at Sloan's Lake, uh, where we know simple filters uh, could address the water quality there and start to make the needed improvements immediately, and then develop a long-term plan for prioritizing how we're spending those dollars and making sure you're seeing them in your communities, the return on that uh, ballot issue, uh, ballot initiative that we approved. Thank you. Rebecca? Class candidate on this question, Renata Behrens. Renata, how would you ensure that your parks department allocates the resources needed for parks facing these challenges? Resources, okay, I, I would buy Excel that uh, the citizens have um, affordable energy. And on the other hand, I would take care of the air pollution by uh, free traffic, free uh, public transportation, as I said before, free electric buses, and yeah, and green. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's Renata Barrett. Thank you. That, uh, any rebuttal? That completes our uh, environmental topic. We have now come to our closing statements, everybody. You've done a fantastic job as an audience. I want to thank you. Before we get to our candidates and their closing statements, uh, I'd like to ask you to help me thank the only people working harder than these candidates tonight have been our two timekeepers, Alex <laughs> statements we've allowed one minute for each a candidate to offer a closing statement we select the order by drawing numbers out of the hat that uh, order gives us Leslie here Leslie please join us for your one minute closing statement uh, thank you I want to thank everyone for being here and um, my colleagues or candidates here as well um, I have a tattoo on my wrist it so says Nail City Numine uh, that's the Colorado State motto nothing without Providence or nothing without God but for me, that means nothing without faith. Nothing without faith for our, of ourselves, faith of our neighbors, you know, faith to do things. That we can get things done. And as I stand here today, um, I know so many times people have said things that we cannot do over and over and over again, including some of my colleagues here today, things that can't be done. Don't believe that. If I believed what couldn't be done, I wouldn't be standing before you as a state representative today. I want to see you, not MIT. If I believed what they told me about myself, we wouldn't be fighting for things like police accountability and led the country in that fight right here because of protests that were happening day in and day out. And if we believe what they have you, what they you to believe today, they would say that we could not tackle affordable housing and our unhoused, unhoused neighbors and our crises that are happening on our streets right now. We can. We can get more housing for people. Thank you. We can get the jobs done for Denver. Thank you. We will deliver. <laughs> <laughs> Our next candidate for their closing statement is Jim Walsh. Thanks everyone for being here. This has been an amazing experience for me. I've never run for office, so this is kind of a crazy thing. You know? And uh, but I, I've been biking all over the city. I call it my bread and roses tour. The old the old labor saying for those of you who have had any labor education. And there's this old labor song called Which Side Are You On? 
They've never heard it. Yeah. And that is, that is the foundation of my campaign, which side are you on? Why have we never had a mayor on the side of workers in this city? What's going on? So my, I hope to be that mayor. I hope to support collective bargaining rights of all public employees. I hope to support, to, to raise union density in this city. I hope to support worker-owned cooperatives. I hope to support worker centers so that our immigrant brothers and sisters have more protections. Universal basic income and harm reduction for all public health issues. Denver workers first. Thank you, Jim Walsh. Our next, is, the next closest team is Renata Behrens. Renata. I would like to change the language of the government, especially on the ballot, so that uh, every um, normal or uh, average uh, citizen can understand it. Secondly, I would ask you not to look down at the homeless people if you were not homeless yourself. And second, uh, the third, I would like to ask the homeowner to get rid, rid of their lawns. They are very energy intensive and water intensive and they are good for nothing. Grow, grow a little garden, grow a little garden and, or have somebody grow the garden on your property. And if you do not need the produce, give it to the homeless or the homeless kitchen. And um, the last one, I think uh, you should vote that Denver gets the mayor that we all need. Thank you. Thank you, that's from Dr. Behrens. Our next candidate is Terrence Robbins. It's time in Denver that we move past yes we can, and we need to implement yes we will. Last year our public safety budget was $566 million. That was 39% of our general fund, only 2% of that went to housing, but every municipal candidate is focused on housing. Affordable housing. Affordable housing is affordable for who? Okay, we need more public housing. We need to make Denver a 24 hour city. No more three term mayors. No one up here deserves to be mayor for 12 years. It's too hard to unseat any coming mayor. We need to change our city um, charter to add more democracy to our city. We need an elected police offic um, officials. We need an elected sheriff. We need an elected city attorney. We need to add more democracy to the city of Denver. Our housing issue is our main issue. It should not have only 2% of our budget as going to housing. We need a double digit housing budget, budget and we need a public banking system to pay for more retrofitted or newly built public housing that will lower our violence. Thank you very much. Terrence Roberts for Mayor.com. <laughs> Thank you, Terrence Roberts. Our next candidate is Aurelio Martinez. First, I want to thank you all. Thank you for listening. And what I want to say, I mentioned earlier that my whole reason for running was to, for the, for the residents that live in Denver, for the neighborhood organizations, for the workers and the small businesses in Denver. They have to be able to have a word in what happens to them in this administration. That's the reason I'm running. So I want to tell you, one way, one, one thing that I'm going to do that's going to make that happen is I will put together an office of ombudsman and liaison because the current administration that has community outreach people hasn't worked for 30, 40 years, and it's not going to work. But the job description of an ombudsman is to field every complaint, inquiry that comes into them, and they have to come up with resolution. They cannot just let it get stale and forget about it. They have to come up with resolution, has to put that resolution on my office, and it has to happen. Your word will be what happens in this city and happens in your neighborhood. Thank you. AMFDM.com. Thank you. <laughs> that was really Martinez. Our next candidate is Lisa Colderon. I am running to be the first truly progressive candidate of Denver. We have had false choices for the past two administrations that have not put workers and, and residents first. And instead, I would like to share power with the community. We need to decentralize Denver government uh, by moving resources into neighborhoods. We need to embed our services where people naturally congregate. So libraries, rec centers, we need to have one-stop shops 
for people who are struggling in this city. This is a race between the past power brokers and the future. And I want to fundamentally change the way power is wielded in this city. We should not have the same people who have been running the mechanisms in this city backing other candidates. It's simply changing faces. We need a total transformation in leadership of Denver, and I'm the candidate to do that. Thank you, Alicia Calderon. Let's get to our next candidate, Robert Trento. Oh, yeah. We you bet we need a transformation. We've needed a transformation for 15 years now. The city of Denver has almost put me out of business three times, not giving me my permits to do work. It's spilling over into everything. When I have to wait a year for building permits, I'm passing that cost along to, to you guys. You're gonna pay $100,000 for every new build you see out there. Building practices that are ridiculous. The regulation is insane. The bureaucracy involved is crazy. It's adding to the homeless problem, I mean, every day. We need real change. I know how to do it. Climate, uh, air quality, renewable energy. I lead by example. I don't just talk. I'm not a politician. I want some real, real results and I want them now. And I will do them as soon as I take office. Thank you. Thank you. That was Robert Trudeau. Next candidate is Thomas Wolf. So I'm running because I, I know Denver needs to be safe, clean, and smart. All right up there. And uh, I think the city's anything but that. And the reason is it needs strong, competent, fresh management, fresh leadership. Um, I, I have an analytical background. I, I, I was a student in science as well as finance. I'm not very good at pop politics. I'm not very good at sound bites. But if you want to get to the core of issues and, and solve them and solve them so they stay solved, um, I'm your person. The, uh, an example on this encampments, if you're okay with encampments, um, it, it's killing our property values in downtown Denver. If you're okay with that, that means uh, 50 percent decrease it's 50 percent of the budget for DPS okay it's 50 percent of my budget or excuse me it's 11 or 12 percent of my city budget as your mayor if you're okay with encampments heads up that's coming so you need to know that as well um, Thomas Wolf thank you thank you it's Thomas Wolf next candidate is Kelly Brown thank you all so much for giving us this chance tonight to spend time with you um, I've told you a little about what I intend to do. I want to share with you how I work. Uh, because my approach to solving issues is really about bringing the most diverse voices together. People who see the world differently. Experts uh, who have worked in these spaces. Uh, learning from our past, looking at what other cities have done, using data to guide our decisions. That's my approach to solving really challenging problems. It's why those five mayors in the metro area endorsed my homeless plan. It's why former manager of safety and police officer, Al Kay, former executive of the ACLU, Denise Maez, former governor and district attorney for Denver, Bill Ritter, have endorsed my public safety plan. It's recognizing the only way we're gonna address these issues is if we come together as a community and find a path forward. Like others, I've never run for office before either, and I'm not gonna run for another. This is it. But I have run the city of Denver, and I would love the chance to do it again with you. Thank you, this is Kelly Brook. Next candidate is Chris Hansen. It's such an honor to be with you tonight. I'm State Senator Chris Hansen, and I'm running to be your next mayor because I want to build a city that works. Right now, I'm feeling pretty frustrated, like many of you in the, in the building and online joining us tonight. I'm feeling frustrated because the city is not working. I'm an engineer, I'm a private sector leader, I'm a public sector leader. I've gotten big things done over and over at the state capitol. I've managed multi-billion dollar budgets in the private sector and the public sector. I know how to get things done. I'm asking for your support tonight to move Denver forward. I wanna end with a story though, one that's deeply personal. A couple months ago, I took my boys downtown. We jumped on the 15. 
And I immediately started getting questions. Dad, why is there a drug deal at the bus stop? Dad, why are there encampments all the way downtown? Why don't I feel safe in downtown? As a father, that is heartbreaking. We can't continue in this direction. I want to build a city that works, and I'm asking for your support. Thank you. Chris Hansen, Chris Hansen for Denver Mayor. Thanks, Dominic. Thank you. That's Chris Hansen. Next candidate is Ian Thomas Lafoya. I want to close by saying hi, Mom. I know you're watching at home. But to all the RNOs who put this together, thank you so much. I've been an RNO president, and I've been involved in RNO, registered neighborhood organization politics for more than a decade. My name's Ian Savoya. I was a teacher. I've worked for three branches of local government. I've worked at all three levels of American government. I've brought people together to pass more than a dozen laws that have impacted the people of Denver when our leaders have failed. I believe that we do need to call everyone together. That is an ancestral belief of me as a Native American man. We have to call in all four directions, black, white, yellow, red, elders, youth. It's time that we do bring people together and you need to elect people who rolled up their sleeves and went and picked up the trash during the pandemic. My name is Ian Thomas Tafoya. You can find out more about me at tafoyaformayor.com. You've seen the work that we've been able to do together. Imagine if we could do it every day because together we rise and we do build back better. Thank you. Thank you. That was Ian Thomas Tafoya. Next candidate is Debbie Ortega. I want to thank Regis for hosting this tonight and all of the RNOs who are part of uh, bringing us together. Um, my commitment to service started when I was a young child, when my dad would help other um, miners, coal miners who were injured, and I would go with him to help to deliver food and money to those workers. And that um, same service that he provided to them were reciprocated to my family. When my dad died, when I was five years old, he was involved in an on-the-job injury. And just seeing the, the impact that he had on those families and those families had on mine, that is the commitment to service that I've had to this city over the years that I have been an elected official. I've worked in the trenches with our neighborhoods. I've been working to solve environmental and housing issues, and I could go on and on. But now is the time when this city needs someone who understands how this city works and has the skill set to make that happen. Thank you. Ortega.com. Thank you, this is Ortega. Next candidate is Mike Johnston. Thank you. When we all walk out of this debate tonight, we're gonna to walk back out into a city that we love. But the truth is tonight in that city we love, half of us that live in this city can't afford to live here. Tonight in that city we love, 100 people will go to bed and wake up tomorrow and have their car go. In that city we love, tonight 1,400 people are out right now trying to look for a place to sleep outside of the street. Why are we letting that happen? Right? This is our home. The spirit of Denver is that we are not the victims of our own story, we're the authors of our own story. So the question is, what chapter are we going to write next? Are we going to write another chapter about this city as a city that didn't house all of us, or protect all of us, or include all of us? Or are we going to write a chapter about this city, which is one where your kids can dance all through downtown and not worry about their safety? Where teachers and nurses and firefighters can live in this city again, where we know that everyone can feel safe. We've built this city once, we can rebuild it into a city that we love. Thank you. That's the chapter I intend to write. I'd love to be your next mayor. Thank you, this is Mike Johnson. Next candidate is Kwame Spearman. I'd like to ask everyone to do me a favor. Go home tonight and think about your neighborhood. Think about two things you love about your neighborhood. And think about two things your neighborhood needs to improve. I love our neighborhoods. We are an amazing city because of our neighborhoods. And I want to create a government where we go into our neighborhoods and we listen to our residents. We allow our residents to empower this city to its greatness. We ask our residents, what are your thoughts on safety, on housing, and on the local economy for your neighborhood? And I want to create a city government that is responsive to that, that has goals around that. Because I can tell you, as a CEO, the only way that you can accomplish great things 
is you've got to have a strong vision, a strong team, and you've got to make everyone feel seen and be heard. We can do that in this city, and we're going to do it through our neighborhoods. Kwame for Denver.com. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. That was Kwame Spearman. Our next candidate is Trinidad Rodriguez. I was born and raised in West Denver by a hardworking single mom. It was a neighborhood that was rich in love, but money was tight. We had uh, faced housing instability, addiction, violence, personally. But this city helped us actually through those tough times, and I wanted to pay it forward. So when I started my career in finance 25 years ago, I started giving and serving the entire time our city's most important and efficient civic and nonprofit organizations. My financing and my uh, leadership helped build uh, affordable housing communities, hospitals, clinics, and schools that went on to serve tens of thousands of Denverites. It is a, uh, I'm ready to, we are ready to build my vision of a city where every Denverite, regardless of the neighborhood they're in, has that can go on to their uh, version of success. Trinidad for Denver.com. Thank you, Trinidad Rodriguez. Our last day of the night for his closing statement, Andy Rougeau. Almost done, everybody. So, my name is Andy Rougeau. I'm running for mayor of Denver because I love this city. It's the city where I settled down after the army. I came to Denver I came back from a deployment to Afghanistan with the Rangers and I moved in with my now wife. It's a city where I built a business. I grew a business from 12 employees to nearly 50. A blue collar business, fixing gates for self storage units where I cover, come home covered in sweat and grease and I couldn't hug my wife until I'd taken a shower. It's the city where I'm raising a family. I've got two amazing little girls. And our mayor and our city council and some of the politicians behind me are taking that opportunity away from the next generation. They are taking the opportunity away by letting skyrocketing crime, skyrocketing homelessness, and unaffordability of housing in our city to crowd us out. As mayor, I will fight for our future by making sure we're adding foreign police officers to our streets, by making sure we're enforcing our camping ban, and making sure we're building enough housing in our city. Join me at andyfordenver.com and learn on how I'm going to fight for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking all of our candidates. <laughs>